Welcome to another episode of One Idea Away, where we're committed to living more fully, deeply, and consciously. Why? Because when we do, we're calmer, we're clearer, we're more connected, more joyful, and much more alive. On this show, we bring you stories of those that are figuring it out just like us, as well as experts who can shed light on the hows and the whys all of this stuff works. So I want to thank you all for tuning in and sharing and reviewing our show. If you haven't done so yet, please drop us a review. Also, subscribe to the podcast on our feed, whether it's on iTunes or whatever app you happen to be using. And if there's something that stands out in the show... Do us a favor. If it makes you think of somebody, share it along because this show is meant to get the conversation started, not just to drop in for a little inspiration. So with that, let's turn to this week's episode. Today's episode is sponsored by, well, us, One Idea Away, and very specifically by the 10 Days to Connection Challenge. You see, we ran this really interesting experience for our community in a slightly smaller way to, to bring people into greater connection with themselves, to clear away the mental clutter, to detox their hearts so they could be more open and free with the experience of life that they were having. And it went amazing. We received such incredible feedback about how wonderful this process was and how freeing it was for people to really really connect to life in a deeper way and move past all the stress and the chatter and all the things that distract us on a day-to-day type of basis that ultimately disconnect us from who we truly are and the life that we love. And so this 10 days connection challenge is meant to help you clear that, that clutter, that mental chatter that keeps you from connecting to that happier life. It helps you to create the space that you deserve to simply take a breath to uncover what makes you happy and to let go of anything that isn't working. You get to detox your mind, detox your heart, and connect to that life that you wish to experience and learn how to bring out more in you and in everything that you experience on a day in and day out basis. It's just five to 10 minutes a day for a week and a half and it's one of the most beneficial things you can do for yourself to create that space that you need to connect to the life that's waiting for you. Just go over to oneidealway.com forward slash connect. That's oneidealway.com forward slash connect. And I look forward to joining you there. Today, we're diving in and filling up on a different conversation than we usually have. But to do it is to get at the heart of an issue that comes up in so many different ways on this show. Each of us have experienced that dreaded sensation of discomfort. It comes up in many varieties. Sometimes we're uncomfortable in that restless, bored kind of way. And at other times, it may be that we're uncomfortable with certain feelings and thoughts that are arising that we just simply don't like. And instead, we want to push them away or silence them or distract ourselves from them. And so we find ways to reintroduce comfort so that we can feel okay, so that we can feel something more pleasant. Well, in today's world, there are so many wondrous dopamine-filled ways to distract ourselves and to soothe our discomfort. We can gaze mindlessly at our phones and social media. We can binge on the latest must-see TV series. We can grab that drink, or we can reach for that time-tested, always-been-there-for-us friend that knows how to just make us feel good and filled up inside. And of course, that friend is food. (laughs) And not just any food, but preferably that sugary goodness or that creamy, gooey, cheesy anything, or perhaps that doughy softness of pizza or the fresh warm roll or bagel. Can you tell I'm an Italian from Northern New Jersey yet? Anyway, in all seriousness, we're talking about food (laughs) and specifically what food is comfort. And we're doing that with the author of that very book, Julie Simon, When Food is Comfort. And so as we have this chat today, a few of the things I want you to keep in mind is first, what's your food? Meaning, is it food or is it social media or a drink or TV? Whatever it is that you binge and, and fill up on to soothe yourself. And then secondly, we're not really just talking about food. We're talking about what's underneath it, what keeps us disconnected from our true selves, from that inner wise knowing voice and from seeing and learning to get comfortable with the actual reality that we're coming into contact with. And so Julie Simon is the author of When Food is Comfort and the Emotional Eater's Repair Manual. She founded the popular LA-based and online 12-week emotional eating recovery program and offers workshops at venues like Whole Foods and UCLA. And with that, Julie, thank you so much for being here on One Idea Way. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. So one of the places that, you know, that I I certainly like to to start out with the interviews is to ask a little bit about where does this story really begin, right? We get to talk to you now that you've you've done this and you've researched this and practiced it. You've literally written the book on it. But where does the story begin for you? Well, that's a good question because I think where it began for me is where it begins for 
many people, especially uh, young girls. Yeah. Um, it started for me in my teen years, in my 20s. I uh, was starting to put on weight and, you know, the freshman 15 and, <laughs> um, you know, that back then it's just like today, there was lots of processed food and I was grabbing it on the run. And I would, like I said, I was starting to gain weight <clears throat> and began a cycle of dieting, you know, kind of overeating. Um, and of course, stress of college and a uh, young person's life began to overeat, uh, turned to food a little too often and gained weight. And so that began a cycle of overeating comfort foods, gaining weight and dieting. I was always very interested in health, fitness, nutrition. Uh, I intuitively, even back then, had a sense that we were not meant to count calories, carbs, fat grams, weigh and measure our bodies, weigh and measure our food. <clears throat> even though everyone around me was doing it, it didn't make a lot of sense. It seemed like you know our ancestors didn't do that. They didn't have scales. They didn't weigh and measure their food. They didn't count carbs and fat grams. And, and I thought, we it, there has to be a way for us to maintain our weight. So I set out on a quest, uh, even through my undergraduate years of psychology and biology, set out on a quest to figure out all the pieces of the overeating or imbalanced eating puzzle. What I found out over time was that I had entered adulthood missing many basic self-care skills, like mm -hmm. the ability to move through unpleasant emotional states comfort and soothe myself, reframe self-defeating thoughts, and regulate my nervous system, I began to understand that I was an emotional eater uh, because I had those, because I was missing those skills. And while my parents were well-intentioned, they were also missing these skills. Mm. To add insult to injury, I had, had inherited body and brain chemistry imbalances that made unhealthy comfort foods and stimulants like caffeine and nicotine even um, both attractive and addictive. And so for me, it took many years of study, therapy, and visits to healthcare practitioners for me to understand and resolve all the pieces of the overeating puzzle in my own life. And uh, once I ha had a pretty good handle on all of that, I knew that I wanted to help other people resolve that so that they could be free of uh, these challenges yeah. uh, forever. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's because it, it's it's amazing and and interesting, and I think it's an important part of of the you know of this story of of the story that's out there is that you know, we even look at today's times. There's you know in terms of nutrition and what to eat, and not to eat, and all the different uh, diet nutrition programs out there. The knowledge of how food is processed and manufactured in ways that are not as healthy as they really you know could be. We're knowledgeable about all these things, and yet we're at the unhealthiest, heaviest stage that we've ever been in. And what you're really getting into is uncovering, okay, that's kind of the surface issue. Now, there's a lot more involved than, than, than what's going on with our food system and everything else. But you're, you're looking underneath and saying, okay, there's a symptom of something deeper that's there. And that led you into this deeper psychology. So I was wondering maybe to get a little also of your perspective then of why now, meaning why, why is this book so important and so timely to what is going on out there in society right now? Well, a, a couple of reasons, kind of like what you said. I mean, first of all, we have so much, uh, we have so much processed food. We have a lot of people that are overweight. Two thirds of uh, U.S. adults are overweight. 80 million Americans uh, are dieters. But to me, even more importantly, you know, overeating is a complex behavior and yeah. its resolution requires a comprehensive multidimensional approach. And one piece of that puzzle, which this book uh, addresses, is that I think the global obesity crisis is really a nurturing crisis yeah. of epidemic proportions. And if, if you think about children today, uh, they're not, no longer are we being raised in a, a village. No longer do we have large extended families. Children are raised by parents who are, you know, overwhelmed, uh, very distracted, often single parents, um, and this is never to blame parents, but I think there just isn't enough uh, kind of nurturance around young, little ones today, mm -hmm. even if there is maybe grandma, maybe uh, little one sees grandma once a week, maybe mom is working full time, dad's working full time, and there isn't a village, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, people had much larger families, there were much larger extended families, so 
if mom was distracted or mom was depressed or dad, you know, had some kind of illness, there were a bunch of other elders that could step in and did step in. And so I think children today are really uh, at risk of there not being enough nurturance and parents aren't nurtured. The parents come to see me. Mm. These are the ones who are overeating and they don't know how to nurture themselves. They're not getting enough nurturance in their lives and they don't know how to nurture their children. So nurturance is a big issue here. That's really interesting. So how how does that impact us when you know when we're in our childhood and and we're not raised by the village it's it is this nurturance uh type of issue that is likely there as it is for so many households nowadays how how does that actually impact us i mean what what's really going on there well nurturance good consistent sufficient quality nurturance is critical for uh the development of the brain uh the hmm. infant and and small you know babies toddler's brain is developing. And so <clears throat> when we talk about nurturance, we have to talk about something called attunement. So good nurturance involves attunement, a, a caregiver that's very tuned in to the infant and small child's emotional states, right? Mm -hmm. And so the infant um, has emotions, which no labels yet at that stage for emotions. So the infant is crying, there's tension in her body and her mommy swoops in and with her behaviors and her words and her eyes and her tone, she comforts and soothes. She tunes in to the baby's states as that baby gets a little bit older and maybe starting to talk a little bit. Mommy swoops in again. She uses her words now to comfort and soothe. What's so important about this, about this, that mommy or grandma or someone, some caregiver has these skills, is that the brain is laying down its tracks, if you will. It's laying down circuitry, uh, connecting parts of the brain that are going to be the regulatory parts of the brain that are going to be the soothing, calming, um, comforting function laying down circuits between that and the emotional brain, the, the animal brain, the primitive brain that we all have, fight, flight, you know, freeze. Uh, we're going to be laying down those tracks. So good attunement from our caregivers is what helps uh, structure the brain in that way. And if we don't have that good attunement, if we have um, – we don't get enough nurturance where maybe we have even worse, you know, abuse, neglect. Our emotional brain becomes dominant. The connections mm. between that and the, the top part of the brain with the soothing regulating function don't get laid down properly. And we will be wired for high reactivity. So what that looks like you know, later in life is that when something happens, we are more easily aroused, we're more easily activated, we're more easily agitated. And if those connections to the soothing, regulating part of our brain haven't been well developed, we're not going to be able to comfort ourselves. We're not going to be able to soothe ourselves. We're not going to be able to attune to our emotional states and regulate them. Wow. I mean, Number one, how many people out there just went, uh, yeah, easily agitated, easily, ir you're like checking a list on some of the things that I hear all of the time in terms of that reactivity that we find ourselves in in life. And that it is tied into the way in which our our, our brains are wiring themselves so that that emotional center and, and some of the lower and midbrain that is there ends up becoming a much more dominant you know, a, a force within our lives. And that affects obviously the way that we perceive things, uh, all the different circumstances and situations and relationships in our lives. So what are, maybe what are some of the patterns that, that you've started to see that, that kind of underlie this emotional eating so that we can begin to understand then next of how do we start to undo these patterns? Well, that's a good question. So how would you know if you're emotionally eating? You yeah. might be using food as a tranquilizer, to dull emotions that are difficult to cope with. So when you experience that high reactivity, anxiety, anger, frustration, hopelessness, sadness, loneliness, shame, guilt, and perhaps even happiness and excitement, you turn to food as a tranquilizer. Maybe you're using food to calm yourself when you're experiencing unpleasant bodily sensations. So that might be like agitation, muscle tension, butterflies in your tummy. Perhaps you're turning to food for soothing and comfort. Many of us use food for pleasure, escape, fulfillment, and excitement. We eat because we're stressed out. The minute we start to feel stressed, we grab something. We might be eating because we're not feeling 
a lot. We're feeling kind of numb. We might be using food to silence critical, self-defeating thoughts and quiet Mm. our minds. Perhaps we're eating whenever we feel overwhelmed or we're feeling paralyzed, can't get to the to-do list. Maybe you're eating to distract yourself from low motivation states like boredom, lethargy, or apathy or because you cannot activate yourself. You might be eating as a way to procrastinate. Perhaps your life lacks purpose, meaning, passion, and inspiration. You're trying to fill up an inner emptiness with food. You might be eating because you have a lot of regret regarding your life. You don't know how to deal with the regret. Perhaps you feel deprived in life. You might be eating to rebel against someone or something. Maybe you're eating to punish yourself. Perhaps you're eating to reward yourself. So you can see a long list of um, ways that emotional eating manifests. Absolutely. And I I think the... So what's interesting to me is that it shows up in all of these different ways of of what we might be trying to cover up, what is that we may not be trying, we're trying to not feel at any given moment, uh, what we're trying to distract ourselves from. And as, as you kind of went through your own journey and you, you, you found even some of this own checklist, checklist in, in your own life, part of your story, you highlighted three specific areas of self-care, self-talk, and self-regulation. And I guess the, the one that just jumps out at me, which I wouldn't normally associate with with this issue of of uh, emotional eating and overeating and things like that, is self talk. And I was wondering if you could talk, you know, to to a little bit to to describe where does self talk fit in of of what's really going on here and how that ends up ultimately linking itself to the to the emotional eating side of this. Yeah, well, our self talk is so important and. If I backtrack just for a second and we talk about self-regulation, so what does self-regulation mean? It kind of sounds very clinical. Self-regulation really refers to our ability to manage our emotions and our moods, regulate our nervous system, control or redirect those disruptive impulses like the urge to grab, you know, those chips, impulses and behaviors and think before we act, okay? Okay. And so one piece of self-regulation, so there are many skills we need to have in terms of self-regulation. One piece of that uh, self-regulation puzzle, if you will, is our self-talk and and Mm -hmm. making our self-talk effective, okay? Mm -hmm. And research shows that when our self-talk is effective, it kind of automatically regulates our nervous system. So... In the book, I teach a way to talk to yourself and I kind of separate out a couple of parts. So I separate out that very young part of you that says, I just want what I want when I want it. I just want something to eat now and I don't care and I don't care about the consequences. You know, and how many of us have done that, whether it's smoking cigarettes or it's having another drink uh, or it's spending too much money where in that moment when we want something, we're kind of all what I call feeling self, all child, you know, like I want it. I want that purse. It's beautiful. I don't care that it, you know, costs $700. I want it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be no adult, no mature adult on the scene. So in the, in both my books, I teach, I separate out these parts, you know, very simply uh, I call the, the voice of reason, the voice of regulation, the kind, nurturing voice, the inner nurture. And so we learn how to build that voice. Now, what I have found is that most emotional eaters, I would say 99.9% of them, have never really fully developed an inner nurturing voice. They have a very strong inner critic voice that beats them up after they buy the purse or after they eat, you know, the Cinnabon. But they don't have an inner nurturing voice. And so a supportive, wise, kind, caring voice. And many authors have written about this. Research shows that having a voice like this is very effective, developing a voice like this. So I teach skills in in the book, uh, in both books, but we we do a deeper dive in in the second book. Teach skills for developing this voice because when this voice can step in, this voice is actually, this inner nurturer voice is actually going to morph into an inner limit setter. Okay. This, Mm -hmm. so limit setting needs to come from a nurturing place, not from a Nazi sergeant, you know, critical place. Right. So nurturing is more effective when it comes from a nurturing voice. So we learn to slowly develop that voice and that voice is also there. So we, in the, in the book I teach, we begin to develop that voice 
just by identifying that voice will help us identify what we're feeling. Gee, what am I feeling in this moment when I want to go get that Cinnabon? That voice is going to validate those feelings. So we bring that voice in and that voice says, well, of course you're feeling upset about what that argument you had with so-and-so. It makes sense to feel hurt and sad and worried. That voice is going to form an alliance with that young part of you. Hey, you know what? I'm here with you. I'm the wisest, kindest, most loving part of you. I'm here with you and I can help you through all of this, okay? And then that voice is going to help you reframe any self-defeating, critical, judgmental thoughts you have and, and doubts you have about your abilities. So that voice is very important. That it's very important that you have that voice in your head. And where does that voice come from initially? It comes from those caregivers, you know, those nurturing caregivers. Very, We talked about in the beginning that when they come in and they swoop in and you're having emotions and you're a, an infant and a toddler and a young child and mommy swoops in and says, oh, I see that you're having some very big feelings. It's okay to feel hurt about that. That makes sense that you're feeling hurt. You know what? I'm here with you and I love you and I care about you and I can help you move through this. Let's talk more about it, right? So someone yeah. modeled that voice for you you would have that voice in your head. You would already be using that voice. Most emotional eaters, most people with addictions didn't have enough exposure to nurturing um, elders, if you will. They may have had a little bit of exposure, but perhaps those elders were missing some of these skills. So perhaps your mother was very kind and loving and caring but when you came home from school and said, nobody wants to sit with me at the lunch table, she said, oh, I'm sorry. How about I take you out for an ice cream, right? Yeah. So she didn't know how to help you move through those states. She didn't know how to help address those negative critical thoughts you're already starting to have about yourself. She didn't know how to help you improve your self-esteem in those ways, but she took you out for ice cream or to look for a new dress, right? So skills didn't get developed. My books are all about teaching you how to build those missing self-care skills. And the wonderful news is that you can build those skills at any age. How much do you think you would benefit from clearing your mind of just some that mental chatter and clutter that goes on all day long? How much do you think you would benefit to just kind of de-stress, detox your heart just a little bit so that you could feel a little bit more freely and openly once again? Well, this is at the heart of an experience that we just ran for the One Idea Away community very recently. We received this wonderful feedback of how amazing and opening and freeing this whole process was. And now we're ready to roll it out to everyone and to roll it out for free. Meaning this is something that is completely free for you to participate on because we feel really strongly about you doing this, about you connecting to this. You see, it's called the 10 Days to Connection challenge. It's an experience that's designed to help you clear your mind of all of that mental clutter that keeps you from truly connecting to a happier life. It also creates the space that you deserve to simply take that breath to uncover what really makes you happy and let go of things that just simply aren't working. You detox your mind, you detox your heart while connecting more to the life that you wish to experience and learn more about how to bring it out in you. It's just five to 10 minutes a day for a week and a half. It's one of the most beneficial things that you can do for yourself. You'll create the space you need to connect more deeply to life. All you got to do is go over to oneideaaway.com forward slash connect. That's oneideaaway.com forward slash connect to jump into one of the next 10 days to connection challenges. Do me a favor. Please jump in as soon as you can. Take full advantage of this and join the the community that goes along with it because we kind of cheer each other on and champion each other on as we go through this whole process. So you're going to enjoy this. Sign up today. I look forward to, well, connecting with you there. It's a powerful inner dialogue and inner conversation and inner language that it sounds like this really starts to help us bring out because most of us don't necessarily recognize that, you know, sometimes that that voice that's kicking around and whether it's from the inner critic or other parts of ourselves that's kicking around, sometimes it's just part of the way that our brain is kicking out thoughts so that we can understand it. And we don't know how to engage with that. We don't know how to separate ourselves from what seems to be what we're caught up in, the story that we seem to be caught up in. But what you're describing in this inner nurturing voice is something that's very curious, it's very compassionate, 
It asks questions. It's not just telling you what to do or, or what you are. Uh, and it, it seems like it creates a very conscious inner conversation that we can connect to and start to really learn from. Yes. And, you know, so often, you know, we hear it's such buzzword today, you know, self-compassion, a buzz term, self-compassion. Yeah. And, you know, I'm in the trenches working with people every day, working with emotional eaters, overeaters, people struggling with addiction and behavioral challenges. And it's fine to say to people, you know, have compassion for yourself, but many people don't know how to do that. Yeah. You know, what's the how? How do I get there? Someone says, you know, think more positive thoughts about yourself. Well, how do I do that? You know, all these negative thoughts come up about myself and they feel like truths, you know, and a lot of them are based on what we call core beliefs. You know, they've been developed long ago and we've made meaning around them. And so for many people, they're deeply entrenched and you cannot just uh, start saying affirmations, you know, and have them go away. So you need a practice. And uh, I often hear from my clients, I'll say, it feels really awkward to talk to myself in a loving way like that. How sad is that, first of all? It feels awkward to talk to yourself in a loving way. But I get it. So the bottom line is, even though it's awkward, you know, when you learn to play the guitar, it feels very awkward. When you learn to play the piano, it feels awkward. When you learn to speak a new language, it feels awkward. You have to move past the awkwardness, set up a, a, a intention to practice for a period of time. Like I remember when I was learning to meditate and I thought, I'm going to give it three months, you know, and when <laughs> I first sat down, there was no way I could control my thoughts and I hated it. And I timed myself for five minutes. I couldn't wait to sit, get up, you know, it was like, how is this ever going to happen? But I said, you know, I, there are people have walked, you know, ahead of me and have written about this, that there's this blue pearl you could get to. And there's these places in meditation, these deeper states of consciousness you can get to. And I want to experience that. So I'm going to have to keep at it. And as I kept at it, I started to notice much more delicious states that motivated me to continue. So it's the same thing with learning to work with a nurturing voice, catch and reframe those self-defeating thoughts that in the beginning, practicing this nurturing voice is going to be feel awkward. And in the book, I give you lots of examples of what it sounds like if you haven't had much exposure to it, how, what love and kind, warm languaging sounds like. And you set your intention to practice for a period of time until you feel the shift. And it will come. I think that's a, it's a really important reminder and a really important analogy for us to get is that idea of, of you know learning the guitar, learning a new language. This is learning a new language, honestly. It's a completely new skill. It is something that does take time. Uh, it's something that takes practice, but it's like working out in the gym. You're going to see results over time when you look at it in terms of progress and that you do set your expectations for this being about progress, not being about, oh, well, I've heard it once and now I've got to go do it that way. Uh, we don't need to add that pressure to ourselves. It's just not realistic. And also really good to know that you have the exact same meditation experience that I did. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> uh, which I hear from so many people that, that begin meditation is I do want to take one step back to, to then move back forward again, because there was something I didn't want to gloss over uh, in something you also mentioned before around uh, both attunement and, and self-regulation, because the other aspect of this, and we began, you began with that checklist of different ways to recognize uh, some of the, the emotional eating that may be going on. Part of this begins with even just the expansion of our awareness, right? To, to be able to, to recognize some of these signs, some of these symptoms, some of that self-talk that's there to even call it out for, oh, that's just a part of what's going. That's just a part of the voice. And so how do you build, what are, what are some of the, the practices that you have for building the awareness side, the attunement side of, of this equation? Well, you know, in my first book, I talk about um, a little, I have a little three-step process that I teach people and it's called an inner conversation. And in the second book, When Food is Comfort, we, we expand that inner conversation. So the way I like to teach people to do this is you take any, uh, any situation that's causing distress. And if you're really struggling with your food or some other behavior uh, or behavioral addiction um, that you want to uh, stop, then, you know, use that. So you want to go for a cigarette or you want to go for a drink or you want to grab, you know, that cheesy burger. Stop before you do that. Take a 10 minute pause and have a little inner conversation. And this, this 
I designed the inner conversation very strategically so that it would hit a bunch of different points. Okay. So the first thing you do when you pull away is you ask yourself, what are you feeling? Right. And this is critical because connecting to that feeling self, that youngest part of you, that's, you know, responding to whatever's happened, whatever the situation causing distress is, it's really important that you slow down and you connect to yourself. I call it self-connection. Connect to yourself. What am I feeling in this situation? Let me get clear on my feelings. And feelings include emotions. I'm feeling hurt. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling worried. And bodily sensations. Gee, I notice that my shoulders are really tense. My chest feels kind of heavy. My breathing is a little bit rapid. Now, research shows us that just by tuning in to our emotions and bodily states, we're already beginning to regulate our nervous system. So that's a critical skill in and of itself. What am I feeling? Okay. The second step is what do I need in a situation like this? So I'm ready to drive to that, you know, burger joint and I'm not even hungry, you know, so clearly I'm not needing food. Like what do I need? Now, backing up, most emotional leaders have a hard enough time figuring out what their emotions are. Like sometimes they can kick up one, like I'm, I'm upset, you know, like, like a general overall feeling I'm upset. And I'll say, okay, let's, and I, in my books and my 12 week program, I give them lists of emotions, you know, so we can learn the language of emotion. I'm sad. I'm hurt. I'm lonely. I'm feeling empty. You know, what am I feeling? Second step of the three step inner conversation process what do I need right now, given that I just had that uh, difficult day at work and I'm really upset and I'm angry and hurt? What do I need when I feel like that? Now, most emotional leaders will say, I have the faintest idea because they're disconnected from themselves and they're disconnected from their emotions. They're disconnected from knowing what their needs are. So we have to start at square one. Go back. What am I feeling? Get to know yourself intimately. And this, we call this attunement. We talked about the attunement that the mommy gives to the baby. What's the baby feeling? You know, what's going on? We're going to do internal attunement. What am I feeling? What are my emotions? What are my bodily sensations? What are my needs? Oh, I think I need comfort. I need calming. I need soothing. I need reassurance. I need hope, right? So now I'm getting clear all of this in and of itself is regulating our nervous system because we're connecting in a loving and kind and caring way. Third step of this inner conversation process is we bring in that kind, loving, inner nurturing voice. So we begin our practice of bringing that in regularly. Hey, I'm here with you. I get it. I see you. I know you're in pain right now. You're not alone. I'm the wisest, kindest, most loving, protective, caring, empathic part of you. I'm here with you. I can help you. Now, when you're, most people are first doing this, they don't really feel that part has all those <laughs> skills, right? And yeah. so it's a little bit of a catch-22, you know, like you have to fake it till you make it. Um, but it will happen over time. If you have a little more time in that session with yourself, we do a skill called catch and reframe. What are all those negative critical thoughts that are running through your head right now? Catch them, catch one or two. And let's work on using our inner nurturing voice to reframe those thoughts, get to a more positive place in our head. So lots of skill building required for emotional eaters. Um, you know, but there's no time like the present to get started on this if you're struggling with, with your food because there's no diet. If we're really talking mainly about overeating. There is no diet that will ever teach you these skills. Absolutely. I mean, number one, that's a really, really, really helpful <clears throat> series of steps in terms of the, the one, two, three of what are you feeling? What is it that you do really need at this moment? And then bringing in that, that inner nurturer and just a, a kind of that, that, that quick word of, of, you know, recapping that when we keep talking about the, the, the nervous system and specifically the autonomic nervous system, what we're talking about is that when you're able to pause yourself, when you're able to get that breath in, when you're able to be more deliberate with your, your words and your inner dialogue, it literally begins to move us away from that lower brain, from the midbrain, from the things that throw us into reactivity, the, the fight or flight or freeze type of responses that are there and 
keep us much more connected to that higher brain, meaning to the place that does regulate us, the place that that that, that higher power of consciousness and intelligence really truly comes from for us. And these steps are such a wonderful way to be able to walk through. And I'm, you know, I just want to make sure I'm a, I'm confirming here that this sounds like even this dialogue that we're building within ourselves and using these steps as the example. These are even some of the types of steps that we could take as parents to begin to incorporate this language, to model this language as we are raising our children. Yes. I mean, we, I definitely want parents, you know, to be reading this book and learning to do that with their children. And just going back a second to what what we were talking about in, in terms of building these skills that what we want to keep reminding ourselves, because it's just like, you know, learning to meditate or anything else that building these skills take time and they take effort. But the wonderful news is that while you're doing it, you are rewiring your brain. Mm. So while you're doing it, you are creating those integrative circuits. You're creating, developing, carving them out, strengthening the circuitry between the soothing, regulating function of the brain and that emotional brain. So the wonderful news about that, just like as like we said with language, you're learning to play the guitar, you know, you're creating kind of muscle memory and, and procedural memory as you're playing. And that's why it gets so much easier. Or driving a car in the beginning, you're driving a clutch and you think, oh my God, how will I ever remember how to get the foot and the hand and you know, everything going? You're creating <clears throat> memory, you're laying down tracks in the brain. So this process is going to get, you know, 10 times easier over time. You're going to have a self-defeating thought. You're going to quickly turn it around because you're going to have learned how much better you feel when you do that. So it's going to get a lot easier. And as if we go move on to your question about parents, as parents learn how to do this for themselves, any parents that are missing these skills, your attunement for your children is going to get so much better. I have so many overeating parents who come to me and they're struggling with their own stuff. And then invariably they'll say to me, you know, I'm, I don't know how to comfort my kid. You know, my kid throw these, throws these tantrums and I, it drives me crazy. And I say, your child doesn't know how to regulate herself. That's what's going on. She doesn't know how to regulate herself. She can't stop the tantrum. She's having tension in her body. She needs you to co-regulate with her and you need to do that with really good attunement. So if mommy is poorly attuned to herself, mommy's not going to be able to attune to this little one. This little one's going to have temper tantrums everywhere. So I have so many moms who come to me and I teach them how to self-regulate and then their relationship with their children gets so much better and they come to me and they say, oh my God, I can't believe, you know, the whole last year was full of tantrums and now I know how to handle them. You know, I know how to tune in. I know how to nurture. It's so simple. She calms down so fast. And I say to them, it it really is simple. It's just about missing some skills. You know, it it really is. It is amazing the, the impact that something that seems simple to explain now, the impact that it does have as we start to use that not only on ourselves, but with others. And, you know, Julie, certainly feel free to add to this, but I'm going to extrapolate into a completely different scenario than we've been talking about. But I can even see how this is critical for professionals, for leaders to be able to use as well, meaning that when we start to think about the the different ways in which we are leading others, where we can see disengagement going on, we can see gossiping and complaining and all sorts of different behavior that is a different form of some of the emotional eating and some of the lack of soothing and things like that that may actually be going on for uh, for some of the individuals you work with is to be able to just even in your own mind, think about, well, what is it that they might be feeling? What is it that they might be trying to express? What is it that they might really need at this time that they may not be getting elsewhere? And how is it that I can have a much more compassionate conversation to understand these things and to move us forward in some type of capacity? So even what we're talking about and and the the critical nature of what we're doing in terms of our own self-connection, our own self-development, and then how we can use it from a parenting and family and certainly a teacher standpoint as well, it even applies to the workplaces we're in every single day it creates a very different compassionate conversation among us all. It certainly does. I mean, there's no doubt about it that when you, you know, compassion for others is, you know, I think it starts at home. It starts with being able to feel compassion for yourself. And, you know, I see this with emotional eaters all the time that they're, they're quite judgmental, right? And Mm -hmm. they're judgmental of themselves or judgmental of other people. And so I think it, it does, we, we can step this conversation out, you know, into the larger culture and into our leadership roles yeah. 
with, are we bringing a compassionate voice? Are we bringing kindness? Uh, are we nurturing those uh, those around us and working under us? Are we nurturing them in those ways? It's really important. Absolutely. Absolutely. So then, Julie, I guess maybe to, to start to, to bring us around uh, in terms of full circle, one of the things that we love for these conversations to be is not just something that people draw information and insight from, but for it to be the beginning of a conversation, the beginning of something that starts to stir them up that they carry forward in some way. And so what is it that you hope that the, this conversation, uh, the core ideas that you are sharing here, what, what do you hope that this begins for people? I really hope that it begins for people, you know, maybe a deeper look into this concept of nurturance in their lives. How are they, how are they nurturing themselves? Uh, Are they moving forward in their lives in terms of um, a meaningful, productive life with passion and inspiration and purpose? How are they finding that in their lives? How are they moving forward with that in their lives and, and offering that to other people in their lives? Um, and I, I would want to leave everyone with, with the hope that with faith, that if you begin on a personal level, you know, to address these imbalances in yourself, that then you take it, you, you will automatically take it, you know, to the larger community around you, uh, and, and bring it full circle and, and help to heal. You know, we've got, like I said in the beginning that I believe we've got a global, I know we have a global obesity crisis. I believe we have a global nurturance crisis. So, you know, we need to get at the root of this. Julie, I want to thank you so much for being here on One Idea Away, for sharing all of these, these ideas, as well as these insights. And I certainly uh, appreciate as well as very much agree with you about the nurturance issue that is out there, the, the compassion issue that is there for us to address and how much that idea is connected to so many other symptoms and issues that we are wrestling with. So, Julie, thank you so much for what you're sharing with the world and the work that you do in it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been my pleasure. Absolutely. And so again, for everybody, I want you to encourage you to check out When Food is Comfort, as you can hear, this is a a deep conversation. And interestingly, though, it's paired with skills. It's paired with things that we can use in our everyday lives. And that's really the nature of the conversations we we hope to have here on One Idea Away, meaning what are those profound ideas? What are those insights that really shift the way that you see things, that shift your awareness and consciousness? But then what can you do with it? How can this make an everyday difference, a meaningful difference on that everyday type of level? So I want to Thank you once again for dropping in on One Idea Away. And as you know, until we meet again, continue to enjoy the journey. Hey, as this episode is wrapping up, you may be asking yourself, what's next? Well, what's next? I hope that you've been joining in on the monthly live cast that we do for the One Idea Away community. You see, every single month, we gather some incredible guests that are talking about the types of transitions that they've made or are even in the midst of making to create a happier life, to create a life that's more aligned to who they truly are. So we're talking about happiness and purpose. We're talking about community. We're talking about how do we have that modern day success, meaning how do we succeed in our happiness, our well-being, our quality of life, while also making a great living, making the difference in the contributions that we are each meant to make. So when you get involved in the monthly live cast, you can ask some questions of our guests. You can participate with some of the other community members and the ongoing chat that just seems to explode as we get into these deeper conversations throughout the whole hour that we do this. So the only way though that you can get these special episodes is when you register for them. It is free, but you got to register to get involved and continue the conversation as we're always talking about. So just hop on over to oneideaaway.com forward slash live cast. That's oneideaaway.com forward slash live cast. Join us there, get involved in the conversation, get involved in the community. I can't wait to continue the conversation with you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you really enjoyed it, do me a favor, let us know. You can keep the conversation going and send us a message on our Facebook page, which is simply One Idea Away. Go ahead and tag me in the post or even just direct messages. Also, I would be incredibly grateful if you could share this episode along with someone that you believe could benefit from hearing the ideas and the messages that we got into. 
That's pretty much why we do this. So you can just go ahead and share it from your app or email it along, whatever works for you. The point is, is to share, to talk, to discuss, and keep the dialogue going because it's in those conversations that ideas can take hold and create profound shifts in perspective. That's what allows us to live life more fully, deeply, and consciously. As always, we would love to see you post a review for the podcast and iTunes or whichever app you're using. And until next time, remember, you're never more than one idea away from a whole new reality. This is Luke Iorio and One Idea Away, signing off.